Hey everybody, how's it going? Thanks for joining me this afternoon. I've got a great stream with a great guest who I think you're really going to enjoy. Now, uh, Professor Edward Dutton has a great YouTube channel of his own under the Jolly Heretic. He talks a lot about intelligence and research, all kinds of different things about civilization and how intelligence impacts it. So when I saw the story in the media recently about IQ falling, uh, they're kind of finally admitting that IQ uh, scores are falling. People do seem to be having lower IQ scores, but they said it's not a big deal. We shouldn't worry about it. I thought Ed Dutton would be an excellent person to talk to. Ed, thanks for joining me. Hello. Good afternoon. Good evening. How do you do? Doing great. Good, doing great. So we're going to get into all these different aspects of IQ. Is it falling? Is that really an issue? How does this affect society? What does IQ actually do? We're going to get into all of those questions, but first let's hear from today's sponsor. Hey guys, I know a lot of you are taking care of yourselves. You're working out and you're watching what you eat, and that's great because you got to start taking care of things like your liver. Why? Well, because the latest data from the American Heart Association shows that adults with fatty liver are three and a half times more likely to have heart failure than those that avoid it. The American Liver Foundation says that over 100 million Americans already have fatty liver, which means a lot of people are at risk. There are so many things in our daily lives that can impact your liver. Cholesterol, alcohol, toxins. If you're leaning on things like Tylenol or statins, it can all have an impact. That's why so many people have a sluggish, fatty liver that makes them gain weight and lose energy. Your liver has a ton of key functions, which is why you want to take care of it. And liver health formula can help. It's an all-natural supplement that contains 12 clinically proven botanicals, which help to recharge and protect your liver. It's also manufactured right here in the United States and approved by American doctors. Diet and exercise are key, but if you want to add something that will protect your liver and boost your energy, try Liver Health Formula and receive five free gifts when you order today. First, you'll receive a free bottle of blood sugar formula to reduce sugar cravings, and you also get four free ebooks to support every aspect of your health. Try Liver Health Formula by going to Get Liver Help dot com slash orin and claim your five free bonus gifts that's getliverhelp.com slash orin there's a link in the description down below that'll take you right to it all right guys so let's go ahead and jump right into it uh, professor dutton a lot of people were talking about intelligence but they might be confused as to all the different aspects what is intelligence and why is that so important if it's going down Okay, well, intelligence is the ability to co to solve cognitive problems and how quickly you solve them. So the harder the harder a problem is before you're stumped, the less intelligent you are, the less intelligent you are, and the more the longer it takes you to solve a problem, the less intelligent you are. So a highly intelligent person can solve extremely difficult problems and can solve them quickly, which is why reaction times, basically overall body fun nervous system functioning, is a robust correlate of intelligence. Um, the, to go into slightly more detail, intelligence, it, it can be conceived of a bit like a sort of a pyramid. At the, at the base of the pyramid are specialized abilities which are weakly associated with intelligence, you know, the ability to drive a car or, or uh, I know, do up your laces or make an advertisement for something to do with liver. Um, and then ab above that, you have the, uh, the three main kinds of intelligence, that is to say spatial, verbal, and mathematical, and they all intercorrelate. And above that, you have something called G, general intelligence, which is the pinnacle uh, of intelligence. So um, so that's intelligence. And it's about 80% genetic, which means that about 80% of the reasons why people are d differ in intelligence is to do with genes, and about 20% is to do with environmental factors, such as having a uh, having a highly stimulating environment or whatever. And we measure it by IQ tests, and the average is, is, is set at 100, and you get smaller and smaller. It's like a bit like height, you know, and it, it, smaller and smaller percentages as you get away from the mean. And why is it important? Well, because it underpins basically every I mean, why are we, we're having this conversation it would be unthinkable uh, as recently as 20 years ago it's important because every aspect of civilization is underpinned by intelligence uh, if you think about the correlates of intelligence achievement motivation altruism analytic thinking abstract thinking artistic preference and ability creativity diets with reference to what you were advertising before uh, a, a, a minute ago educational attainment eminence and genius uh, fitness uh, income, uh, uh, eventually any 
any component of civilization you can think of, of, of law abidingness. I mean, I could go on and on and on. Any com component of, of civilization you can think of. And in fact, we have uh, very reliable uh, data on national differences in average IQ. And what you find is that the lower is the average IQ, the less able they are to sustain things like san good sanitation or education system or, or uh, um, uh, lack of corruption or whatever. So intelligence underpins civilization. And if intelligence goes down, then ultimately what that could lead to is the collapse of civilization. Now, I think a lot of people would look at that and they'd say, okay, well, I, I understand why IQ would be really important if I want to program computers or design buildings or, you know, make sure that certain things function. <clears throat> but I know plenty of really smart people who are awful. I mean, some of the dumbest things coming from our society right now are coming from people who are so supposed to be the smartest people who have really high IQs, don't know what a man is, can't define what a woman is. Can you explain why intelligent no, no, people on, would no, be no, saying they, that? They, kind of thing? They, they, there's a number of things to break down there. Mm -hmm. So for, for, first of all, um, the fact that the fact that you a person can say, "I know plenty of people that don't have high IQ, and I don't know they do well in life or whatever." That's that's just appeal to anecdote. That's that's just a fallacy. Uh, we have sound data on this. How well you do uh, at school, let's say. So how well you do in school leaving exams, and that is a good. Um, proxy for intelligence that correlates with IQ scores at about 0.7. Uh, your income correlates with IQ at about 0.4. Uh, so these, these are reasonable correlations. It means there's lots of variations, other factors involved, like personality and things like this. But um, your, your income, your education level, uh, and many, many, many other things will all correlate with intelligence at the, at the individual level. So that's the, uh, based on the data. That's the first thing. And it's important to reach conclusions based on the data, not just based on personal anecdotes. Um, the second point that you made is regard to uh, what you might call clever sillies, intelligent people saying manifestly stupid things. Well, there are reasons for this. So one of the correlates of intelligence is social conformity, essentially. So people who are highly intelligent are good at norm mapping. They are good at looking around the society, noticing what the dominant set of values is, and forcing themselves via their effortful control, via their intelligence, essentially, to believe those things, to accept the veracity of those things, and then competitively signaling um, uh, th their, ad their adherence to that dominant set of values in order to attain status. And, if, and that what that can lead to, ironically, is a situation where the views that they will advocate will be less in line with the objective reality than a less intelligent person who doesn't have, as it were, sufficient intellectual, uh, can't, can't perform the intellectual gymnastics necessary to force himself to believe something so manifestly stupid. And so the, 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 that is one of the sort of more subtle and interesting reasons why it is that at the moment it would be a less intelligent person that would say, yeah, a woman's a woman, a man's a man, and a more intelligent person who, who would probably say, oh, well, we have to define what we mean by woman, we have to define what we mean by man, blah, 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 blah. So, um, uh, so the overall, what you will find is that it is certainly true that intelligence correlates with uh, all of the things I read out and many, many more, and certainly with socioeconomic status. So if that's the case, and I think there's probably a decent case for most people to understand that, you know, the the intelligent uh, rebel isn't exactly the, the archetype people think it is. Most people do find the the advantage of, uh, of, like you said, understanding the social norm and the advantage that go along with it. Then wouldn't that mean that a lot of people who are opposing the current wokeness, the per current woke ideology, wouldn't they be overall lower IQ if they're not noticing the social benefits of going along with this? Um, uh, yes. Uh, well, no, it's, not, no, it's, it's slightly, uh, slightly more complicated than that. So um, you can see that there would be some people. Let's, sort of, let's, let's break this down. It's a very good question. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, yeah, you're going to say overall in a very left wing society, you're going to expect right wing opinions to be associated with low IQ. That's that's true. Um, and overall, you're going to expect intelligence to predict social conformity um, and therefore uh, 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 you're going to expect intelligent people to be very much um, in with the current ideology, uh, if not spearheading it. But the other thing that is associated with social status is a certain kind of personality. Mm -hmm. And so we have to look at the um, interaction between the personality type and the heritability of personality, i.e. the genetic component of personality is a bit less than intelligence. It's about 50 percent. 
Um, the interaction with the personality type and the intelligence and the intelligence. And we also have to make a distinction between what we might call normal range high intelligence, i.e. anything between uh, or normal range, you know, uh, I don't know, 100 to 130. That's the normal range. And then outlier high intelligence, i.e. above 130. And those can be quite different things. So with regard to the intelligence, um, people who have outlier high intelligence, this tends to be associated with, with aspects of autism. Why? Because autistics are obsessed with the truth. Uh, autistics take in large amounts of information. And the more information you can take in, the more subtly uh, and therefore parsimoniously and accurately you can solve a problem. And the essence of intelligence, remember, is solving problems. And autistics also tend to notice subtle differences and notice them very quickly. So you would predict then that, yes, in general, intelligent people would be uh, in very much in favor of the current thing and would competitively signal their conformity to it. But you would also expect people with outlier high intelligence to do the opposite, to critique the current thing and um, in, in pursuit of truth or in pursuit of uh, systematizing or, or, or whatever would be associated with, with autism. So that's the first nuance. The second nuance is the interaction between personality and intelligence. So if you've got that kind of personality type where uh, you are um, high in uh, sort of conscientiousness and uh, agreeableness and this kind of thing, then this will tend to make you generally quite socially conformist. And so if you add to that the intelligence, then this might make you, to a certain extent, conformist to, the, to the, current, the current thing, right? But on the other hand, if you have high intelligence and you add that to agreeableness and conscientiousness, then what that can mean is agreeableness and conscientiousness can be associated with traditional religiosity. And this can make you then inculcated with certain conservative views. And therefore, because of your religiosity, you might oppose the, the left wing society and, and the current thing, even though you have a reasonable uh, level of intelligence. And then we have to look at the dark triad traits. And the evidence is that people that are intelligent plus high in narcissism, that is to say they like to be admired and looked up to and so forth, or high in Machiavellianism, that is to say that they like to be, uh, uh, they like power. Uh, those people tend to be woke because that's how you get power in the current society. It's by via competitively signaling wokeness and so forth, and then people look up to you. However, uh, people that are high in psychopathology, those people are high in risk taking. They enjoy risk and conflict and whatever. And that those people tend to be associated with the alt right. So you they could get intelligent people that are high in psychopathology. So you can see how you're getting these nuances that you're going to get overall. Yes, if you were to interview the population, I'm sure you'd find a weak correlation between wokeness and IQ. But there's all kinds of reasons for there to be nuances where you're also going to find high IQ people that are opposed to wokeness. Interesting. So the IQ test itself, this is the th thing that the article uh, in, in Fatherly, which is kind of a ridiculous progressive rag, but they, they had a very funny uh, headline to basically, yes, IQ is, fa is falling, but it, it's not a big deal. And their reasoning was that basically we're getting a reverse Flynn uh, effect, that IQ tests are getting worse at measuring general intelligence. Could you explain the Flynn effect and kind of what how good IQ tests are at measuring IQ? Well, um, the the, me the, me the measure of the usefulness of an instrument is normally how well it, um, it normally how well it correlates with um, with with other other intuitive measures of the same thing, um, and uh, and so you know, and people don't like that. People don't like uh, the discussion of, of intelligence and objective intelligence because often it triggers them if they've had some negative experience at the moment in, in their life on it. You know, we've got someone. Um, in the chat at the moment called Neuron Network, for example, who is extraordinarily triggered by everything I'm saying. You know, one wonders whether to feed the trolls or not, but perhaps he did badly in an IQ test when he was a child or whatever, and it sort of scarred him. But these IQ tests, are um, they, they correlate very strongly with other intuitive measures of intelligence, such as uh, educational attainment, such as uh, national scores on these uh, 
on, on these uh, scholastic tests that they do, um, such, 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 such as whatever. So that's the measure. It's a good instrument, but it correlates with these objective things, you see. And then people want to say, oh, well, it's, it's, it's culturally... It's culturally mediated. It's 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 uh, it's it's biased against certain cultures. But that can't. That's if that were the case, then it, it, it correlates with objective things outside of IQ tests, such as point three with with reaction times or um, point three with the size of the head. So it correlates with objective measures. So what this is telling you that it's. Um, it's it's tapping into something real. It's tapping into something objective. It's measuring something um, accurately, and so it's it's reasonably reliable. Um, and your second question was about the nature of the Flynn effect. So what the Flynn effect was is I I, I mentioned earlier this um, this sort of uh, triangle of uh, this um, pyramid pyramid of intelligence, and uh, and you know, these 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 levels of intelligence. So what was happening uh, was that the IQ test is an imperfect instrument at measuring intelligence. Um, and it's it's um, so what was happening was that across time from about the 30s till about sort of the 90s, certain specialized abilities at the base of the intelligence pyramid, which are which are very weakly associated with intelligence, were increasing and increasing massively. And at such speed that they came across on the imperfect IQ test as an IQ rise because they were they were overwhelming everything else that was happening. And the theory of James Flynn was that these it was that society had across that period increasingly adopted scientific spectacles he calls it so society was making us think in a more scientific way and so these um similarities these specific subtests uh, which are weakly correlated with g uh, were were massively going up and the model is that at the same, it's called the co-occurrence model, that at the same time that was happening, general intelligence, uh, and these, of course, are very, very environmentally sensitive, I should stress. Yes, these things at the base of the pyramid are very, very environmentally sensitive. So they were being pushed to their phenotypic maximum. At the same time, by all other measures that we are able to trace across that period, we were becoming less intelligent. And so what you would expect to happen is that, is that the IQ scores would go up until the phenotypic maximum for similarities was reached. And then you would start to see IQ scores going down, even on the IQ test, because they'd already been going down based on other measures that are more um, measurement invariant across time, like reaction times or color discrimination or whatever. But you'd expect, and that's exactly what happened. And in about 1997, you start to see evidence of a negative Flynn effect. And that is on G. And G, the G factor, is uh, highly uh, uh, genetically mediated. And indeed, that was on the subtest because intelligence, again, it's like height in the way that it's distributed, but it's also like height in the way that um, like how big your trunk is, that's massively genetic. And how long your legs are, that's massively environmental. And in the same way, you get different intelligence subtests that are highly genetic and those which are highly uh, environmental and if the effect is on the genetic ones we call that a jensen effect after 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 arthur jensen and the the um flip the negative flynn effect is a jensen effect i.e it is it is on g so it's caused by a genetic effect so everybody kind of shifts into modernity the average person learns a lot more about scientific language and concepts and so this kind of artificially inflates the way that people take IQ tests until yeah. it, reach, it reaches the kind of the max uh, ability of people to kind of adjust for that. And then once that effect is over, we're re left with the fact that IQ has actually been decreasing despite I mean, of this it, artificial it, it, rise. The point is, it, intelligence is, is decreasing. Intelligence is decreasing, but it's not showing up because the IQ test is an imperfect measure mm -hmm. of intelligence. Uh, it, uh, the, the IQ scores are not increasing. In fact, they are increasing. And yeah, that's because this specific thing this specific uh, uh, correlative intelligence is being pushed so massively and so quickly to its to its phenotypic maximum. And I'm trying to find here. There was a here we are um, in the, in my book. This is my book. Adar Witt said, "Why we're becoming less intelligent? And what it means for the future." And this is a quote from uh, a, a, a Russian. Uh, academic who interviewed in about 1920 Russian peasants to try about uh, with cognitive problems. Okay, I had the question: There are no camels in Germany. The city of B is in Germany. Are there camels? Are, are there camels in Ger uh, there or not? I don't know. He says I've never been to German villages. If B is a large city, there should be camels there. Question: But what if there aren't 
any in Germany at all? Answer, if B is a village, there is probably no room for camels. And so he, he just can't, the subject just can't think in a way, analytically, that is to say, that we now take for granted. So I think a lot of people, this might be obvious, but we might want to clarify it real quick. A lot of people might say, okay, well, if IQ tests could be wrong in one way, if they could not be able to properly measure because of the Flynn effect, couldn't they be wrong in the other direction? Could not could the article from Father be, Fatherly be right? And the IQ test is just not measuring newer ways in which, or different ways, like spatial reasoning in which people are improving. Is, is that a... I know that's. I know the answer is going to well, be no. But two, two <laughs> points I, I would make. One point is that although we have found in the earlier negative Flynn effects that it's on G, that mm -hmm. it's on genetic components of IQ tests, uh, what one might expect to happen increasingly is that because we are becoming stupider at the genetic level, uh, then we would um, this would set off a literal Flynn effect in reverse, i.e., we would become stupider for environmental reasons. And this would show up on the IQ test because the scoring system would be worse and we would be less able to push people to their phenotypic maximum intelligence. So there would be a literal Flynn effect in reverse. So we could start to see that. I'm not aware of it yet, but we could start to see a reverse Flynn effect and it's on uh, it's not a Jensen effect. It's it's on the more environmentally mediated traits. Uh, as for the argument, oh, what well, the, the, the IQ test, oh, it's just an unreliable test. Well, if that were the case, then... I have I have provided you with a model which explains why it is that the IQ test um, is unreliable. Uh, I have made a prediction as to what would happen uh, um, um, if if my model or Michael Woodley and my colleague's model of what's going on is correct. And I have shown that that is correct, and that's what's going on. And we are declining genetically on uh, uh, on, on IQ uh, on these IQ tests. And while we're doing that, then we know that the prevalence of alleles in Western uh, native populations that is associated with uh, our, our IQ is going down. We know that we are breeding. Uh, for uh, I for alleles, which are negatively associated with IQ and also negatively associated with health, and on all of these other measures, um, there is evidence that, um, such as reaction times or, or color discrimination or backward digit span or, or uh, creativity or whatever, uh, we are becoming less intelligent. So I don't think that that uh, uh, that that does not imply that there is some fundamental flaw with the IQ test at all. That implies that we we've identified one flaw with the IQ test. Um, and we know why it's happening, uh, and that, that and that's uh, uh, and that uh, it uh, otherwise it therefore fits with the overall picture. And I should emphasize that IQ tests and their uh, their abilities to measure IQ not across time, but among one cohort at any given time, um, uh, it, it replicates again and again and again and again and again. So I guess the next question most people would be asking then is why is IQ going down? Why is intelligence going down? Why are we selecting for this? How is that working? That's very interesting a question. There's a number of reasons for it. So the first uh, was that we were we were under harsh Darwinian selection until about 1800, and then uh, we have, of course, the uh, the rise of the Industrial Revolution, and the child mortality rate in 1800 was about 50 percent, and gradually it's gone down to about one percent today. And there was a relationship, it seems, but we were we know we were selecting for intelligence because the richer 50 percent of the population had doubled the completed fertility of the poorer half based on English parish records. We've got evidence. Uh, other other markers that we were becoming more intelligent across time, and um, so therefore we were essentially selecting, we were bootstrapping the population. We were selecting out those with low IQ every generation, and we were doing that via the high child mortality of, I guess, what one would call the of the lower the lower classes of the time. Um, which is why if you trace your family tree back to about 1600, everybody in England will find they're descended from the upper middle class, because anyone that was below that does not have surviving descendants today. Um, and so so what will happen then once it, 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 things that are ge genetically selected for tend to come, become player typically correlated. And so intelligence would have been player typically correlated with genetic, mental and physical health. And so what, what once you have bring in the Industrial Revolution and you bring in better medicine and whatever and inoculations, then these people that would have died due to poor health, who would also have had, uh, been more likely to have uh, mental problems and low IQ, they're not dying off. They're surviving and passing on their genes. And uh, this was noticed and people were worrying about it as early as about 1860. 
um, the French doctor Benedict Morel was the first person to present his uh, concerns about it. So the result of that is that where, whereas once people with low IQ are, are, would uh, would would be purged from the population every, every generation, along with those that have had poor genetic health, uh, that's not happening. And so by about 1900, the evidence indicates there is no longer, we have this based on education data, there is no longer a relationship between intelligence and breeding. The, the relationship doesn't exist. It's just nil. Uh, and then it starts to become negative. Now, why does it become negative? Um, first of all, contraception, uh, contracep reliable contraception. It's taken up by the higher classes, um, uh, moves down the society. In, in contraception is basically an intelligence test. Uh, um, if uh, one of the correlates of intelligence is impulse control and and uh, uh, time preference. So people that have low IQ, they're too impulsive and they're too in, unable to think about the future and they just accidentally get pregnant. Uh, the second is that it's, it has to be used properly. It has to be used correctly. Um, the example I always give is when you take the pill, do you take it at exactly the same time every day like you're supposed to or do you just sort of take it when you remember? And that's the difference between getting pregnant and not getting pregnant. So the second thing is contraception. The third thing is, to a certain extent, is feminism, really. So if we think back to when we were at school, um, think about the 16-year-old the girl. She drops out. She's not very bright. She drops out of school at 16. She has a series of relationships by a series of men. She has kids by each man. And by the time she's about 38 or something, she's becoming a grandmother. And then the more intelligent girl, well, she spends all of her 20s and increasingly, even the first half of her 30s, concentrating on her career and things like that. And so she, she either doesn't have children, and the evidence is that the more intelligent a woman is, the more likely she is to literally not have any children, um, or she just has one, or, and, 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 and so on. So, so the, the, that means that those with low IQ, which, remember, is 80% genetic, not only have um, more children, they have more generations. Um, and the third key reason, I think, is welfare, uh, which is that it permits people that have uh, low intelligence, to, to, they, they can live off it. And in, indeed, they often will calibrate their childbearing decisions in order to take advantage of it. Uh, and the evidence is at the moment that uh, only people, only in, in the UK, only people who are on welfare, uh, and also not just on welfare, but who have... Um, you know, the criminal underclass involvement from the police and the social workers, whatever, only that category of society among the native population has above replacement fertility. So um, all of these factors have come together to mean that IQ is going down. And another uh, related factor seems to be that there is some evidence that people, at least at, at this stage of civilization, I don't mean all the time, I don't mean 200 years ago, but I mean at this stage of, of um, sort of high civilization, uh, highly intelligent people just kind of just don't want children. And this was noticed even in the time of Augustus. He noticed that the upper classes weren't having children. He imposed a tax on childless men and they paid the tax. And it's some sort of dysphoria that is experienced perhaps by more intelligent people. They, they, they just don't want children. They lack the instinct to have children. And this could be there is some evidence that people that are more intelligent are more environmentally sensitive. And this might mean that in order for their um, instincts to hit in, their instincts are less built into them. So they have to be put in the exact correct evolutionary roadmap of life. And this, we're in an evolutionary mismatch. I mean, it's like we're in a zoo. You know, we're so wealthy. We're not so... There's evidence. Uh, I did a video on this today on my channel, The Jolly Heretic, that the thing that makes people want to have children is mortality salience. If you prime a person with death and whatever, which is basically our evolutionary match, then they have a desire to have children. So it could be that it's something to do with a lack of instinct, essentially, among the more intelligent. But anyway, these, these are the main reasons why we we're, there's a relationship of about minus 0.1 to minus 0.2 uh, between intelligence and how many children you have in, in Western countries. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up at, at the end there, because I think, you know, my question was going to be, is this just an effect of modernity, just uh, modern technologies and such, because you look at something like Oswald Spangler, you know, and he says that, uh, you know, in all of these high civilizations near the end, you know, kind of, kind of in the winter phases, the people lose their instinct for child rearing. Once having children becomes a question rather than a natural pattern of life, then the, the ability to kind of do it reliably just falls away. And so this, this is not something that's unique necessarily just to our modern condition, 
but something that many different civilizations have gone through kind of a maybe intelligence is in some ways a great filter that uh, that limits the growth of great civilizations. Um, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, certainly if you read Pasha, uh, Sir John Glubb's book, The Fate of Empires, um, he was astonished when he wrote it in the 70s about the, the the points of similarity between Rome, Greece and Baghdad and, and now our modern condition. And I think the, the most parsimonious theory is that when you're under these harsh, intense Darwinian conditions, you uh, you don't really have time to think. You you believe in the religion. Everything is outsourced to the religion, and re religiosity hits in due to mortality salience, which you're going to be high in, and also due to stress, just general stress, which you're going to be high in. So everybody is extremely religious all the time, and you just don't really have to. You just act according to the, what the religion says, and what the religion tells you to do is to go forth, and multiply, and have lots of children because they are blessings from God. Um, there's certain nuances to that, but that's basically what, what it does. It takes that which is evolutionarily adaptive and it makes it into the will of God. And eventually then you get to this point of luxury. You get to this, uh, okay, I mean, we've got a lot further, obviously, than Greece or Rome or Baghdad. But they did get to a point where you don't have to fear being invaded by foreigners all the time. You don't have to fear people coming into your city and massacring you. You have, in the case of the Greek, you have plumbing, you have sanitation, you have education, you have all this kind of stuff. Um, and it's um, it, and it allows more and more people to, to kind of think, essentially. to th you, you have time to think about things and to, um, and, and to be, as it were, more self-aware. Uh, and, and to really contemplate the, the nature of life in a non-religious way. And your religiosity will go down because there's less mortality salience and there's less there's less stress and whatever. So then this means that suddenly if something is not instinctive and built into you, then perhaps you won't you won't do it. And that's true of fertility. And if my model is correct with regard to more intelligent people, that they are more environmentally sensitive, then you would expect this to be more true of them. Um, and then, of course, they would get caught up in any maladaptive ideas that came along, perhaps, if they became fashionable, um, sort of decadent ideas. And so you just get a decadent society that no longer really believes in anything and 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 people don't want to have children. And, and, they, and then they think to themselves, well, if we do have children, they're going to be expensive. So wouldn't it be better that they don't have a sense of the eternal? Um, and there's, as I say, that if mortality salience makes you want to be eternal, it makes you want to have children. It makes you want to be famous, actually. There was a study I was reading today that people desire to become famous and well-known more if they are primed with mortality salience. Um, and it even makes you more likely to want to name a child after yourself. So mortality salience elevates this idea of wanting to make yourself eternal and last forever. You know, it's, it's our evolutionary match. And in every case, uh, Greece, Rome, Baghdad, and now, uh, and now us, you get this decadence where people just stop, the more intelligent particularly, stop having children. And what that ultimately leads to is the society going in going into decline because you, you become less and less intelligent. And eventually you, you, you can't, the society breaks up, trust levels collapse, uh, and uh, you can't really do things you used to be able to do and then and then of course the society collapses but on the plus side it doesn't die out from an evolutionary perspective because presumably if this went on forever then nobody would want to have children and you you just you just die out so perhaps it's kind of built into the nature of things that these collapses must happen so that the species remains optimally healthy yeah it makes me think about vilfredo pareto and his uh, circulation of elites yeah he has these these different residues, these different uh, base kind of personality uh, types that that pursue things, and and uh, his foxes and lions are kind of your your two types of of main elite uh, personalities. And you know, foxes are big on combinations; they're they're going to be your intellectuals. They're going to be ones that want to take different ideas and put them together. And lions are going to be kind of your more standard, you know, uh, patriotic, you know, c continuing. The religious tradition continue the identity types and he said basically you know most civilizations when they become decadent are just filled with foxes that they, they are wholly interested in intellectual pursuits and combinations they lose all senses of kind of identities identity and the need to con you know continuation of the of the culture and that's where you start to get kind of these uh, these ebbs and flows like you're talking about where you, you you know the the ruling class kind of is just not interested in perpetuating the civilization and you kind of have to have a new group come in now he says often that comes through a violent uh, matter because the foxes and more intelligent people have solved everything through kind of cunning and guile and so they tend not to be very good at conflict uh and the and the lions of course are good at conflict they tend to be your more your more martial cast 
And so uh, when you see that kind of circulation, that that re-injection of those who would be more interested in having children and perpetuating the culture, it would come from those who are actually more willing to involve themselves in violence. Well, yeah, and I looked at this in another book that I've done with my colleague J.O.A. Rayner Hills, The Past is a Future Country, The Coming Conservative Demographic Revolution. And, and that was informed a bit by the kind of philosophers you're talking about. Um, and also would be discussing this with uh, uh, Nima Parvini. Mm -hmm. um, and this is that there is this theory that, look, uh, once you are in the situation that we are in, then you have to ask yourself, who's having children? Well, yeah, it's the low IQ, fine. But also there are certain other groups that are breeding. One of those is people that are conservative and people that are religious. Um, and that predicts breeding for various reasons, but it, 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 that, that predicts fertility. And so one model would be the kind of breed them out model, which is, oh, well, all we have to do is wait. And eventually the liberals, because the heritability of political viewpoint can be quite high. It can be about 0.6. Um, the heritability um, is quite high. And so all we have to do is wait for these conservatives to, to just breed them out. Now, there's two problems with that argument. First of all, this is happening in a context of decline, of intelligence decline. So it's not going to be that it's the same, even one day if that does come to, come to, come to fruition, um, it's going to be a much less advanced society perhaps than we have now. But the second problem is, as you say, elite, elite theory, that there are various ways in which it is, it's not important what the majority think, it's important mm. what the elite think. And sometimes the smaller the elite get, the more embattled they get and the more they flex their muscles and whatever and, and take even more power. And so that's not a um, that's not a, a what's therefore more interesting is that if you look into the data of breeding patterns in the US and you look just at the top quartile of intelligence, then the big sterilizer is liberalism. So liber liberals are particularly residing from the gene pool among the very, very clever. And the big. Uh, fertilizer is conservatism, i.e. among the very, very clever, it is it is the conservative ones that are having children, which makes sense, because um, if you're very, very intelligent, then you will be presumably highly inculcated with this woke ideology, and so there'd have to be something to stop that. Uh, for, for what, why would you, as, a, as an intelligent person, be having children? And the answer would be, well, perhaps you have a genetic propensity towards religiousness and conservatism and whatever, and that you just can't, you can't be inculcated. So it, it is that that would imply that over the coming decades, we would start to see the percolation upwards into positions of power, just as the conservatives died off in the 50s and 60s and were replaced at the universities by liberals, you would see something like that in reverse. Uh, and that would that would um, uh, spread throughout other organs of power in society. But I should emphasize that this would be happening at, in a period of decline, which which is, of course, uh, slightly different from uh, from the idea that they're just going to take over the country and make everything glorious again. Yeah, well, really interesting dynamic there would be. Yeah, I think about uh, the the cognitive stratification that someone like Charles Murray worried about. Uh, in kind of coming apart and the idea that, you know, only only the, you know, everyone who's smart is going to college and only the those who go to college are, are, are mating with each other. And so you're not distributing intelligence the way you used to across different different classes. But interestingly, you would also have a situation where that means that fewer people in the general population are capable of doing like maintenance for complex systems. And so you end up in a with a concentration of people who uh, are very good at the manipulation of con complex systems and combinations. Your fox is kind of in your ruling elite, but they're generally fighting over control of a population that has a smaller and smaller pool of people who have the ability to maintain the very mechanisms that they've been trained to manipulate. That's a very, that's a, that's a very good point. And that raises, I think, two interesting possibilities. So on the one hand, you could say, well, you have a stupid, a stupid population. And so there's nobody who can emerge from among that population who can challenge you. So we can think about, I don't know, if you go back to the, the 20s, uh, we had a prime minister in England, Ramsay MacDonald, who was the illegitimate son of a Scottish crofter. Uh, I mean, you, you couldn't get much more of a lowly background than that. But he was obviously an extremely intelligent and able man. Um, but then on the other hand, you would have a population that would be very low in IQ. And so what that would mean is that they would be difficult to brainwash. They would be very low in social conformity. They would be very low in social trust. They would be very open to to balkanization, um, to things like conspiracy theories, 
to, to all kinds of stuff. And so therefore it would be a very restless population that would actually be very difficult to control, in some ways more difficult to control than it was when you had among them uh, a smattering of highly intelligent people that would be the, you know, the... the uh, the ministers of their local Methodist churches or, 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 or whatever, and would sort of keep them in line. So, and so then you would end up with a cultural chasm uh, increasingly developing between the elite and the, the sort of lumpen proletariat who would, who would have very little in common with them. And so that would be entirely consistent with the coming apart uh, metaphor uh, mm -hmm. of, of Charles Murray. And also you'd get more and more things going wrong. And he did look at this. So imagine... Um, a situation, I don't know, 50 or 60 years ago, you might get somebody that was perfectly intellectually capable of being a doctor, but they're born into the working class, they have a poverty of ambition, and so they end up becoming a postman. And they end up becoming rising in the, working in the postal sorting office, and they end up becoming the foreman of the postal sorting office. And then something goes wrong that one couldn't predict. So some unpredictable thing goes wrong. But that person is able to solve that problem because he is intelligent enough to be a doctor. Now, with, with a more meritocratic society, of course, that person is probably not there. Uh, or maybe if he is there, he's a, I don't know, a foreigner who's trained to be a doctor in Libya or something. I don't know. But, it, but he's, he's probably not there. And so that then opens up for more little things to go wrong. So, it's yeah, it's not a good situation. I also wanted to pick your brain about the idea of globalization and how this could impact kind of the intelligence deficit. So we have these different areas where obviously, you know, smart people are not having children, populations are going down. And so kind of the only option if you want to avoid this decline and you can't seem to get your own population to have children is immigration. And so we end up in this situation where we have some of these societies, some of these cities uh like say like a singapore that have like a very like eugenic uh uh, uh, uh um, immigration policy to, to only let in like the best and the brightest to fill very particular jobs but they're only funneling that intelligence from other regions and from other civilizations in order to basically shred it and the city becomes an iq shredder where these that you funnel off the, the best and the brightest but though they don't themselves have children they just disappear into these cities where they don't perpetuate themselves and then you're not just draining the intelligence of a particular culture or society you're actually draining like global intelligence into yeah, these that's, situations. that's a very good point I, that you're you're uh, by, by doing that by putting them in the, the city you're putting them in the most extreme evolutionary mismatch you could put them in and therefore to the extent that they're intelligent and to the extent intelligence relates to, to environmental sensitivity you're making it more and more and more likely that they won't have children and you're giving them reasons not to as well such as the, uh, the flats too small or, or or whatever which are the kind of things that an instinctive person would care less about they just have children and hope that the children would take care of themselves whereas the more intelligent person will want to have a small number of children and really really invest in them and really really look after them and so forth so um yeah it's also i mean the problem with singapore is it's a, it was built as a multi-ethnic society mm -hmm. and um in that sense it's a it's not a, i mean one of the things immigration does is it reduces social trust uh, it reduces social trust because people are evolved to be with people that are genetically similar to themselves and they will trust people that are genetically similar to themselves and they will not trust foreigners for that reason. Uh, but secondly, it reduces social trust even among the natives because the natives kind of become paranoid. Uh, this is uh, uh, James, uh, this is um, uh, the paper, that, E Pluribus Unum is the name of the paper that found this in America. And the guy, the guy, the guy, sat, the guy, the guy that researched it uh, sat on the results for years because it was so embarrassing. But it reduces social trust even among the natives because they have become paranoid correctly uh, that other members of their own group will collaborate against them with the foreigners to get sort of individual status uh, in, in the group. And so it just reduces social trust there. And so then all of the this civic society that's based around social trust, even things like democracy, um, start to fall apart because it, it, it destroys social trust. So immigration is a, a sort of sticking plaster over a over a severe burn. Really, it, it doesn't it doesn't solve the problem, and in some ways it makes it worse because one of the correlates of low IQ is is low social trust, and you are facilitating low social trust by by having any kind of policy of anything other than the tiniest amount of immigration. And um, the, the tiniest immigration is no good. They need serious immigration. If you look at somewhere like Korea, where the average person is having 0.8 children, I mean, within, it's not going to be long before Korea just dies out. 
so so you 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 um there needs to be something done um as far as i can see I, I, as a policy it would be reverse elevating mortality stadiums so i don't know how you do that you know in an ethical way um or the other way to look at it is the sort of doom mongering way which is that these cycle look at greece look at rome look at look at baghdad why should we be any different these cycles of civilization are just what happens they're just built into the nature of things and that we shouldn't see ourselves as individuals we should see ourselves as people with a place in a cycle and as far as i can see that place is early winter and we should just try and make the best of it yeah, I think that is the the way that many people have looked at that. Like I said, uh, uh, Oswald Spangler kind of goes on qu quite a bit at length of, about that process. And so I think there are a lot of people who think that is kind of an inescapable part of that. But then I think there are people who are hoping that intelligence uh, and, and, and ingenuity and, and innovation allow people to kind of escape what has otherwise been a civilizational trap, you know, has 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 been a limiter in a, in an eventual uh, well, collapse. Why would, why would it? I, I, yeah, I find that very hard to get my head around. Why, why would it do that? So how would for it do that? So, for instance, Nick Land. Um, I don't. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him at all, but uh, he's a near reactionary philosopher, and basically his idea is that basically you need to outrun the need for IQ. You need to run, outrun the need for if human intelligence is, is necessarily going to kind of eat itself alive as part of a civilizational cycle, then the only escape from that cycle is to reduce the need for it, which means you have to rely on AI or you need to free human intelligence from kind of its biological necessity, uh, you know, through technological innovation. Um, it, the pretty horrific ends for those of us who are big fans of humanity and tradition. Okay, but but. Then, so you'd have you you'd have all right. So you'd have a society that rather than so what would be happening if we follow his idea is that society is remember that there's a pleiotropic relationship between intelligence and health. So we're in dysgenics. It's not just that we're becoming less intelligent; we're becoming less genetically healthy. We're breeding for strokes. We're breeding for heart attacks. Mm -hmm. We're breeding for all kinds of things. Um, so you'd have this society of people that would be becoming stupider and stupider and stupider, and sicker and sicker and sicker. And there'd be a small um, elite of people who uh, would be getting smaller and smaller and smaller that would have the intelligence to program these computers because it is a high intelligence thing uh, to be able to machine learn. And these people would be would have to somehow, I mean, it would be the humans that would be solving the problems that, 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 that such a low society, IQ society had. And they'd have to, and it would just keep going until eventually what humans would just have, we, 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 we'd be like pygmies. I mean, we, we, until we'd, be like, we'd be just like children. I mean, it would just be chaos. I think eventually the level of societal chaos, if the IQ was that low, would be such that we wouldn't be able to maintain electricity grids. We wouldn't be able to maintain the internet. We'd be like what's happening in South Africa now, which is that there is no electricity grid in South Africa. And you have to you have to have your own sources of electricity. It would be that kind of thing that would be happening. I don't see how his AI could be sustained in that context. I think the idea would be that the AI would be self-sustaining, that it would escape the need for humans to sustain that which it needs to grow and 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 uh, move it would forward. Be an open, it would be an open loop. The AI wouldn't be machine learned to solve very specific problems like it is at the moment. The AI right. would itself have the ability to notice what problems needed to be solved and solve them. Right. I think that that would be the idea. But like I said, the, you're the uh, kind of the the horrific results that you're describing, even if that was true, I think are uh, are a really important aspect of that. That's true. The, A the yeah. AI would basically be farming human pigs. Right. Very unhealthy human pigs. Right. Um, at that stage. Yeah. So but then presumably it would it would institute eugenics. And if it did, it would be farming humans towards towards being. I mean, it's just terrific. Yes. Yeah. Ab um, absolutely. <laughs> and and it's, it's certainly, uh, certainly a, a, an evolutionary mismatch. And I think our lives, to the extent that some of us were still intelligent, would be very unhappy. Yeah. Uh, I don't, anyway, all right. No, I'm with you. I, I, I don't think it's a, it's a. I don't think it's so much a solution, but yeah, it is. It is, I guess, a, a, a possibility, though a horrific one, if it's the case. Uh, that said, all right, guys, I think we got to most of what I wanted to touch on there. So we'll see. I think we've got a few questions for Professor Dutton. But before we pivot over those, Ed, could you tell everyone where to find your excellent work and let us know if there's anything you have coming up that people should look forward to? 
Uh, yes, I'm on the YouTube uh, and Odyssey. Please particularly subscribe there. I want to plug Odyssey uh, and BitChute, the Jolly Heretic. And I live stream on Mondays and Thursdays at 7 p.m. UK time, 2 p.m. New York. I have a guest on the Thursdays and I answer the various intelligent questions that have been sent in on the, on the Mondays. Uh, and then in the description to that, you'll see all the information I have. I've got various books uh, out, all of which you can get on Amazon. And the latest one is The Past the Future Country, The Coming Conservative Democratic Revolution. Uh, and I've got a book coming out in May uh, called Breeding the human herd eugenics dysgenics and the future of the species excellent all right so uh bob honk 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 for uh 249 there uh oh my god it's the billions must die guy i'm not sure that uh that it is the guy from that meme i, I know the meme you're talking about but i don't think uh and about must die i'm saying just will <laughs> yeah, right. If we if we if we get back if we collapse back to an agricultural economy, which is what happened with Rome. Rome didn't get mm. anywhere near as high as us. Rome got to probably the equivalent of the mid seventeen hundreds or something, maybe the cusp of an industrial revolution. And then it collapsed, and they go back to the land, and lots of people died. And then there was a uh, the Great Justinian Plague, and about sixty percent of the population were killed. Okay. And I'm saying that if we got into that situation, it would be ninety percent of us or more that would be that would, would would of course die not least because most people could not cope without modern medicine i mean lots and lots of people are reliant on um, modern medicine for their physical health and and uh, the medical system is one of the first things that will go yeah just a very difficult reality not any kind of prescription there uh let's see adam e for two dollars thank you sir uh is iq today equal to iq a hundred years ago so has iq uh has uh, maybe maybe this is a good time to kind of understand how the IQ scale works. What does a hundred IQ mean? How do they derive 100, that? 100 is it is stable 100, over time? No, a hundred is the average at any given time. So we we talk we talk about the it's a, it's a bell curve, right? A hundred is in the middle. So a hundred is the average at any given time. So um, if we say there are various ways, various proxies we can use to measure intelligence across time. Uh, one of the ones that we can use is per capita major innovation, or per capita genius, because if you have a highly intelligent population, then you have a, I'm trying to think of a book, I have a large graph of this in, hang on a minute. Um, if you have a highly intelligent population, then you have uh, the their, their outliers, their geniuses, they're gonna be sort of mega intelligent, aren't they? And so then they innovate, they innovate uh, so this is the, what one IQ looks like. You see, so it's a bell curve, right, like that. And in 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 the centre, that's the, that's the one hundred. And so if we were to talk about IQ being a hundred now, let's let's say I, IQ is a, is is a hundred now, then um, it is um, it was it reached a peak based on per capita major innovation. If we use per capita major innovation as the as the proxy measure. Um, it reached a peak in about 1870. Um, uh, between about 1880 and the year 2000, we lost based on reaction times, which is probably an even better measure of IQ than per capita major innovation. Uh, we lost about 15 IQ points. So that is the uh, that's a significant difference. That's like the difference between I don't know a policeman and a, a high school science teacher, or between a high school science teacher and a university professor. And if you look at this graph, you can see the way it works across time. You see, and it peaks. This is per capita major innovation, and it peaks in about 1870. So that would imply that was when we were at our most intelligent, which makes sense because those people have been born just at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. I.e., they'd have been born just after harsh Darwinian selection pressures that have been selecting for intelligence for hundreds of years. Uh, began to break down, and then you get the peak that is there for that generation, and then it, it starts to go into decline, right? Uh, there's humps and bumps to that. Um, as for understanding intelligence in the more distant past, uh, we can look at major per capita innovation again. That's another possibility. Here is a graph. This is from Hubner. Uh, and you can see, look at that peak at the top. That peak is about 1870. Uh, and then we go into decline. And you can see these humps and bumps. And they represent, so you've got you've got over here, this one here, this is the time of Plato. This is classical civilization. So that was a peak. And that it makes sense that it would be because there's lots of amazing stuff that came from that point. 
And you see how it, how it goes. So that's how we can understand it. That's one of the ways we can understand it from the past. Another way, these things like alleles and the prevalence of alleles in uh, ancient, ancient genomes. And we certainly are, uh, have higher IQ now than we've had at certain points in the past. Based on per capita major innovation, uh, and also based on the use of very hard words uh, in, in uh, representative bodies of texts, we have about the same IQ now as we did in 1600. All right. I think that's all of our questions there, guys. So thanks for coming by. I want to say again, thank you to Professor Dutton for coming on. Make sure that you check out all of his work. And of course, if this is your first time on the channel, please make sure to go ahead and subscribe. If you want to catch these broadcasts as podcasts, you can go ahead and subscribe to the Orrin McIntyre Show on all of your favorite podcast platforms. And if you do so, please make sure that you go ahead and give it a rating and review. That really helps with all the algorithms. Thanks for coming by, guys. And as always, we will talk to you next time.